loves burgers is just about my favorite animated thing on TV, right after Rick and Morty and Spanish language reruns of Masters of the Universe. Te lo advierto, Skeletor. Abandona el castillo de inmediato. He-Man, no sé cómo lograste salvarte, pero yo... Espera, ¿qué escondes tras esa puerta? Detente, no te acerques más. Ahí está. El poder de Grayskull se encuentra ahí. ¡Atáquenlo! No. And only in small pot because all men named Bob swear a secret oath of allegiance to one another at the age of 13 in a Bohemian Grove ceremony. But perhaps I've said too much. I doubt I really have to explain why otherwise, though. Bob's Burgers is a hilarious show, well written and performed by an excellent voice cast, grounded in a uniquely easygoing sense of humor that's just not like anything else on TV, animated or otherwise. And while the early episodes carried a sense of fear that the characters might be too anarchic and bizarre to sustain lasting interest, once you got used to the rhythm of their various go-to quasi-improvisational tics, looking at you, everything on ADHD, everyone quickly coalesced into nuanced, interesting characters, even supporting players like Gale and Mr. Fishoder. But the more I watch it, the more it occurs to me that there's actually something else going on with Bob's Burgers that, to the degree it can be in an animated network sitcom, is actually verging on the profound. I wouldn't call it the core premise or even an intentional unifying theme, but it is fairly standard for an ensemble comedy to find its way to a unifying theme as said ensemble gels into a cohesive unit. So what big, quietly powerful theme do I think Bob's Burgers has come to be a cultural standard bearer for? Well, call it a reaffirmation of inherent value, mainly because if there's a short shorthand word for it, I don't know it. Here's what I'm talking about. There are exactly two things outside of genetics that unite all five members of the Belcher family. The first and foremost, obviously, is that they're all in their own way creative personalities. Linda loves to sing, so does Jean, Tina composes piles of fan fiction, Louise put on bravado is basically a giant performance art piece, hence the ears, and even Bob expresses himself through his cooking. Hell, even Gail is a creative person after a fashion. Now, a show about a family of creative oddballs is a fine enough idea, especially since it's not set in a creative field or about the creative process. Process, nicely highlighting the fact that the ability to create does not necessarily belong only to people who commit their lives to it. But what makes the Belcher family quietly revolutionary is that the other trait they share is that they're not particularly good at their own creative endeavors. I mean, think about it. When Linda puts on the play in the restaurant, terrible. Her high school band, somehow worse. Jean is all enthusiasm, thus far comparatively little ability. Tina appears to be the quintessential fanfic maven, i.e. not good, and Louise carefully composed self-image tends to crack whenever she needs it most. She couldn't even resist Boo Boo, and while we're told that Bob is a good cook, and he certainly seems to know his shit, it consistently fails to translate into the kind of success he's looking for. Possibly because what brings him the most satisfaction from the creative expression side of things is getting to use unique ingredients and give cute names to the burger of the day. Naturally, they keep trying and often arrive at places that qualify as victories in one way or another for them, but we very seldom get the usual kind of payoff that's afforded to characters in fiction identified as creative misfits, i.e. the wish fulfillment ending where their skill at their particular vocation is so remarkable that it justifies their inability to fit in, or whatever other flaw they're supposed to have. For example, Steve Urkel. Sure, you're a weird off-putting dork, and if you go back and watch it, a borderline abusive stalker, but that's a different show. But he's a scientific genius so brilliant they ask him to go up and work on the fucking space shuttle. No, fucking seriously, go look it up. That's how Family Matters ended. And of course, there's the X-Men, which carries this fantasy to the logical extreme. Ha ha, that thing that made me weird and different also makes me a superhero, or in some cases, basically God, so fuck you lame shitty normal people. See also Peter Parker, the amazing Spider-Man, whose mythos includes a decade-long running subplot about a guy who bullies him in high school worshipping him when he's a superhero. Lots to unpack there. For a more relevant example, look at Lisa Simpson, too smart for her own good nerd who doesn't fit in with her peers or her own family but gets to triumph by being not just smart but genius smart. Oh, and not just a musician but a fucking musical prodigy. And look, I'm not here to shit on Lisa Simpson. Lisa's one of the most important TV characters ever created, and I'd certainly never suggest that misfits of all stripes don't deserve to enjoy this particular wish fulfillment fantasy. I mean, I am one, and my second favorite movie is about a guy who gets to go to space and fight aliens because he was good at a video game. But the thing is, this is really the only story we tend to tell about creatively inclined people who don't necessarily fit in, the wish fulfillment fantasy of different turning out to mean actually better than everyone else. And where that becomes a problem is that it unintentionally carries a secondary implication. If the only way to prove everybody wrong about you is to be in some way exceptional, then if you aren't somehow tangibly exceptional, does that maybe mean everyone was right? As in, hey, great, that one ugly duckling turned out to be a swan, good for them, but what about all the other ugly ducklings who were just, you know, regular ugly, as opposed to secretly being a larger, more powerful breed of waterfowl? Do they somehow deserve the shit they're taking? And that's not even touching on the broader idea of conflating a skill having a commodity value with possessing a skill conferring a moral value, or the idea of misfits only deserve to exist if they're somehow exceptional, being not too far removed from exceptional misfits are the only people who deserve to exist, and that shit does not end up in a happy place, let me tell you. 
and yet we tell comparatively few stories about quote-unquote weird people where the moral is that their lives and anybody else's lives really matter or even have value even if you don't turn out to be a fucking Super Saiyan. And since that's the truth for most of us, you'd think we'd hear it more if only for the purpose of general positivity, which is why it's all the more remarkable for a show like Bob's Burgers to essentially make it something like a central thesis. Bob probably isn't going to end up as a world-class chef. Tina's erotic friend fiction probably isn't building up to her becoming the next J.K. Rowling. Linda isn't secretly a Broadway-level talent. Jean is not the next Andy Kaufman waiting to happen, and Louise is almost certainly not going to live up to her own vaguely megalomaniacal ambitions. And according to Bob's Burgers, that's just fine. They love each other, support each other, and affirm each other's value because they, and by extension the show, accept this as a truism. You have value even if you're not quote-unquote special in some way that the world can put a commodity value on. And ironically, I would say this passive rejection of exceptionalism as a be-all end-all makes Bob's Burgers very exceptional indeed.